Coming up on DTNS, a throat sensor to help you spot when you're sick, how the Apple Watch served as a backstop to a full ECG, and the Donkey Kong record leads to a libel suit. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, April 4th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm uh, Roger Chang from L.A. County. And I'm producing the show today. I'm Amos. Hey, Sarah hey. Lane is off today, uh, but thank you, Amos, uh, for stepping in and helping out. Uh, we were just talking about the history of the word glom, as well as Roger's secret trip into Disneyland as a child. Uh, get that wider conversation. Join Good Day Internet by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. In a regulatory firing, Uber disclosed its Uber Eats service is pulling out of markets in the Czech Republic, Egypt, Honduras, Romania, Saudi Arabia, Uruguay, and Ukraine by June 4th, as well as transferring service in the United Arab Emirates to its subsidiary Kareem, that's spelled C-A-R-E-E-M, in the coming weeks. An Uber spokesperson said this is part of Uber's previously announced strategy to only operate Uber Eats in markets where it can hold first or second place in market share. Microsoft Chief Product Officer Panos Panay announced Monday that Windows 10X will be for single screen devices. He said Microsoft and its device making partners will look for the right moment, quote unquote, to bring dual screen devices to market. Apple and Google announced that health agencies will need to sign some legal addendums if they want to get access to the company's exposure notification system. The agencies must agree to use the apps only for the COVID-19 pandemic, minimize data collection to that needed to make it work, collect user consent at multiple stages for the little information it does connect, and never ask to use location services. HP announced the Omen 27i monitor, the company's first gaming monitor to use an in-plane switching panel instead of a twisted pneumatic. It ships today from $500 at Best Buy. The Omen 27i has 1440p using LG's Nano IPS panel and has HDMI 2.0 and DisplayPort 1.0 ports, plus two USB-A connections and a headphone jack, all there in the monitor. HP also announced the Omen 25L and Omen 30L gaming desktops. They have some improved venting and airflow. You get the option of an Intel Core i9-10900K or an AMD Ryzen 9 3900 chip. There's also Wi-Fi 6, NVIDIA GeForce GTX, or RTX graphics up to 2080 Ti, and maxes of 64 gigs of RAM, two terabytes of solid state drive. The 25L Omen starts at $900 and the 30L starts at $1,200, both of them shipping on May 5th. Intel confirmed it's acquiring Moveit, spelled M-O-O-V-I-T, in a deal valued at $900 million. Moveit provides traffic data to third parties beyond Intel, such as Uber and 7,500 different transit authorities. Intel confirms to TechCrunch that Moveit's existing services will continue, but that Intel plans to expand the services it offers via Mobileye, which Intel acquired back in 2017. And on April 30th, F-Secure disclosed two major vulnerabilities in the SALT open source framework used to manage servers. The two exploits combined could be used to bypass login procedures and let attackers run code on SALT master servers. Saturday night, attackers used those two exploits to access the core infrastructure of Lineage OS, an Android-based operating system for mobile devices and set-top boxes. The Lineage OS team said the source code and the builds of OS were not affected, and that signing keys, the things that are used to authenticate the OS distribution is the right one, were stored separately from the Lineage OS main infrastructure and therefore also unaffected. The servers were taken down Saturday to be patched. All right, let's talk a little bit more about a high-profile Amazon quit. I would say retirement, but I think he just quit. Amazon Web Services Vice President and Distinguished Engineer Tim Bray, who's fairly well known out in engineering circles, announced that May 1st was his final day with Amazon, saying he, quote, quit in dismay. Bray said that Amazon's firing whistleblowers who were making noise about warehouse employees frightened of COVID-19 was, quote, evidence of a vein of toxicity running through the company culture. Amazon says the workers were fired for misconduct unrelated to their protests. 
Bray himself has signed a letter calling for climate action by Amazon in the past and was arrested for protesting the Trans Mountain Pipeline in Canada, but he said he began complaints about treatment of employees for being a whistleblower uh, going through the internal system and did not get satisfaction, and therefore he said he just couldn't do it anymore. Uh, what I take, my immediate takeaway from this is this whole controversy with Amazon, their warehouse workers, especially in, in the middle of the pandemic, uh, is not going to go away. It's not something that is going to go away soon or go away quietly. Yeah, I mean, wh whether you agree with Tim Bray or not uh, is is a separate question. But the fact that uh, someone of his stature, uh, he's been with Amazon for six years, he's well known, as I said, uh, is deciding to, to, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, uh, get rid of his job, I think is, is significant. Uh, it means that this is, like you say, Roger, a problem that's not going to go away for Amazon. Uh, it's going to shine a little light, more light on it. Uh, it's still possible that Amazon did fire these employees because of misconduct. It, just because you are also a whistleblower doesn't mean that you have carte blanche to do whatever you want. Uh, it's also quite possible and uh, certainly has lots of precedent in corporate history that conduct that might have been forgiven or being a slap on the wrist uh, in the past becomes a firing offense when you're also not liked uh, and you might not be liked because of your stance on uh, the way employees are being treated. And no company likes to have the way they're treating employees uh, criticized, certainly not when a bright spotlight is shining on you in the middle of one of the logistically most challenging uh, times in world history. Um, I have a feeling that one of the, the beneficiaries of this will probably be uh, more... Uh, more uh, an increased adoption of warehouse autom automation where mm. like, you know, just like, Hey, you have fewer people working these jobs, less likely you're going to have something people are going to complain about. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's going to happen anyway. I think you're right. Uh, just because for social distancing purposes, any kind of automation will help, but that's going to worsen your labor problem. If you put in more automation, you're going to have more people upset that their jobs might be threatened by automation. So you're going to have to do something else to make workers feel safe uh, and and having one of your distinguished engineers quit is not going to help you with that. So I, th I think we're going to have to see Amazon uh, do even more to reach out to workers. And I think you're going to see the last of people getting fired for being a whistleblower because I don't know that Amazon can, de I mean, I, sh I shouldn't say that, maybe they will, but I, I, don't, I don't think they want to deal with that, that kind of look uh, after this high profile resignation. An article in the European Heart Journal describes how a heart condition in an 80-year-old woman was caught by looking at evidence collected by an Apple Watch. So the woman came to a hospital in Mainz, Germany, complaining of chest pain, irregular heart rhythm, and lightheadedness. Uh, I, I don't know the, the particulars of this, but uh, yeah, I can imagine she might come in and say, my chest hurts, my heart's pounding, I'm a little lightheaded, doc... Uh, what's wrong? Am I okay? And uh, they put her on a 12-channel multi-lead electrocardiogram, uh, which would be a, a perfectly legitimate thing to do, and they find no evidence of a cause. So then, uh, you know, your, your mind might leap to like, ah, the doctors are, are missing something. But probably what the doctors are thinking is, well, what is causing this? Let's, let's try to figure this out. The woman decided to show them her Apple Watch, which the new Apple Watch, when you touch the crown and launch the ECG, can do a single lead ECG. Uh, this is not meant as a replacement for the multipoint ECG. The 12-point multipoint is much more accurate, but it doesn't make it perfect. And occasionally those Venn diagrams overlap. Uh, and in this case, the readings from the ECG of the Apple Watch showed some evidence of a what is called a myocardial ischemia. Uh, so the woman was transferred to a lab for treatment. Uh, they were able to uh, put a stent in uh, and uh, alleviate the problem that they otherwise might have found in another way, but found much quicker because they had more data to go on. I mean, that's that's one of the the great spinoff benefits of of uh, uh, fitness trackers, or not fitness trackers, but you know, uh, health tracking apps like that are. It's not just, you know, when you get hooked up to EKG, I mean, uh, they, they have you, or uh, uh, ECG, ECG, not EKG, uh, they have that data from the time they hook you up until they unplug you. 
when you have your watch, you have it for days, if not weeks at a time. I mean, there's a there's a mountain of data that is collected that they you won't ne- you wouldn't necessarily get in a say like a thirty minute doctor's visit. Yeah, and and it's not like the ECG on your Apple Watch is running constantly, right? But yeah. but it you know the the fact that they had it uh, available as a double check also doesn't prove that the Apple Watch is better than a 12-point ECG, uh, but it does say that, hey, this this extra collection of health data means we have more data to go on. Uh, and yes, in almost all cases, the full ECG will be better than the Apple Watch. And the Apple Watch ECG may point out things that are mistaken that a 12-point ECG will say aren't right, but in this case, and this is a journal article, so, so the doctors looked at this and said, no, it wasn't a false positive on the Apple Watch. Uh, it was a false negative on the 12 point. Uh, and so, hey, when you're doing this, you have to look at more than one factor. And in fact, you know, the backstory to this is they didn't just look at the 12 point ECG or the Apple Watch. They were looking at other factors like what, what the person's heart rate was, what her medical history was, what her self-reported symptoms were. That's how they caught it. Uh, it wasn't a magic bullet, right? Uh, it's definitely it's definitely more data points, the better. Yeah. Scientists at Northwestern University and the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab have developed a small sensor that looks like a Band-Aid that can be placed on the throat. So right in that little depression where you would do a tracheotomy, that's where they put it, because when you're there, it can monitor your breathing, uh, your pulse, uh, a lot of things. And in this case, they were monitoring for signs of COVID-19. The team modified the sensor developed for monitoring speech and swallowing in stroke patients, but they said, okay, let's take the same data it could collect for that, and let's look for signs of somebody having coronavirus. A high bandwidth tri-access accelerometer measures movement on the surface of the skin, so it measures your breathing, it measures any coughing, it measures your heart rate, it measures your temperature, and once a day, it's not broadcasting, you place it on a wireless charger where it also syncs its stored data with a tablet. So that makes it easy to keep sanitized. Uh, you don't you don't have to be broadcasting from your throat. It doesn't have any ports or anything. It's just wireless transmission. Uh, and the data is then uploaded to a HIPAA compliant cloud server where an algorithm looks for particular patterns. Now, there's a little bit of machine learning going on here in that algorithm, but that's not the key. The key is it narrows down to say, okay, we think we might have found something. And then a human who is trained to do this, a trained medical professional, looks over what the sensor reports and decides, hey, yeah, no, that that really is probably COVID-19 or not. And if it finds a match, the data uh, is then forwarded to medical providers. 25 test subjects have been wearing the device for about two weeks. I think it's super cool because it's uh, one of those things that uh, is developed. I mean, it, it's often at times of great need that a lot of these innovations come around, right? Because people, there, there's a there's an overwhelming necessity. What's interesting is like before they tried the accelerometer, they were thinking about putting a microphone on it to to, to do the measuring. And it's like, well, no, you're going to get all sorts of ambient noise, people talk and stuff. Let's just figure out where the tissue is moving, in this case, your skin, uh, with, with this with an accelerometer, and we'll measure it that way. And it's it's pretty brilliant because oftentimes when you think of this, how do you, how do you listen to it? Well, you don't necessarily need to, quote, unquote, listen. You just need to verify what, what's happening uh, in that, and you can measure that through uh, tissue movement. Well, and, and this is great preventative maintenance, preventative measures uh, for high-risk populations, uh, people in healthcare. I can see them putting this on nurses and doctors, uh, people in nursing homes, uh, you know, people who are just elderly, people working in grocery stores, you know, with high exposure to the public as a way to say, OK, yes, we still need comprehensive tracing or testing. But what if we also had a way to indicate like you might want to do a test right now because it kind of looks like you have this before you're particularly symptomatic. Now, I guess you have to be symptomatic for this to work, but a lot of times asymptomatic can mean you don't show symptoms and that's it's not gonna help with that. But asymptomatic can sometimes mean like, well, I didn't have a, a strong cough, I didn't have a high fever. Uh, and this may be able to catch some of those earlier cases just as they're making that transition from being asymptomatic to symptomatic. And the earlier you catch this, the the better, right? The fewer yeah. people you're exposed to. And uh, like with the previous story, the more data points that you have yeah. to, to, to present a picture, the better. All right, the big news today, Apple dropped a 13 inch MacBook Pro which now includes the Magic Keyboard. Uh, the pricing starts at $1,299. That'll get you a quad-core 8th gen Intel i5, 256 gigabytes of storage, 8 gigs of RAM, the touch bar, 
a physical escape, escape key, uh, 500 nits display, so that's nice and bright, uh, supports the P3 color gamut, and two Thunderbolt 3 ports that are also USB-C. Uh, you can also upgrade that, get the 10th gen Intel processors from some faster RAM uh, models with four of the Thunderbolt 3 USB-C ports. Uh, but the big significant part is that now, with the MacBook Air and the 16-inch MacBook Pro also having the butterfly keyboards, or I'm sorry, the scissor switch keyboards, Apple no longer sells devices with butterfly keyboard switches. So that five, six-year experiment is now finally over. Uh, it's not an experiment, Tom. They've just slowly moved from uh, one, one product development to another. It's From just... one great product of development to an even better one. Yeah, exactly. That there was nothing wrong with the previous design or engineering. <laughs> uh, it just outlived its usefulness, and they've developed something better. It is unusual. And, of course, Apple's not going to come <laughs> out and say, like, no, no, we were wrong. Uh, but it is unusual to see Apple do an about-face like this. Uh, they they generally ride the technology they believe in uh, until, like you say, something significantly better has come along. They're trying to make it sound like the scissor switch version is the best of both worlds. Um, my, my theory though, about this is occasionally Apple's design impulses override its usability impulses. And this is an example of that. They wanted to get those keys to be as flush with the surface as possible. They wanted to eliminate that problem where keys were imprinting on the monitor. They just wanted to make this look as if it were one simple surface without a break, but still feel like a real keyboard. And I think in their mind, they achieved that with the butterfly keyboard because I, it did have more depth than a flat touch screen, uh, but most people didn't like it. If this is the history of Macintoshes. The first Mac that came out was great from a very stylistic, uh, mm -hmm. user-friendly design, but it also overheated like the Dickens, and it was impossible to expand. When they came out with the Mac SE, what did they include? A fan. Uh, so it's one of those things where, you know, everything is just a necessary improvement, but you're never going to say, hey, we really just made a, a, an odd engineering or, or design uh, decision there, and we're just going to correct that. It's like, no, no, it was always meant to be that way. And this is just the next iteration. I mean, the fact that they put in a program to fix the butterfly keyboards uh, and the fact that they now sell no MacBooks with the butterfly keyboards speaks more volumes than Apple could ever say yeah. uh, well, about how they feel about this. Definitely. All right. Therabody is a company that has introduced a new line of four new Theragun massage tools. Uh, one problem with these percussive therapy guns, you may have seen them all over Instagram, uh, is that they're loud, which counteracts the relaxing effect. Now, they're, they're mostly meant for, for sore muscles. If you've been working out, you're, you've been playing sports or, or exercising, lifting weights, it, it's to help kind of ease the pain of, of sore muscles. So they don't have to be quiet, but it doesn't help when they're loud. The new Theraguns have a feature they call quiet force, all one <laughs> word, uh, which is... Kind of hilarious because it's quiet, but it's forceful. Uh, supposedly, though, it reduces the noise uh, to more along the lines of an electric toothbrush than a power drill. So that's good. I think people who like these sorts of things will appreciate that. Uh, there's a new, very affordable, as far as these things go, Theragun Mini for $200. And it's the company's first single-handed device. It delivers 20 pounds of force on three different speeds and gets 150 minutes on a charge. Uh, the $300 Theragun Prime delivers 30 pounds of force with five speeds along with Bluetooth, so you can sync with your health software. Uh, all the other uh, models past this also have Bluetooth. The $399 Elite has 40 pounds of force, customizable speed ranges, so you can just set it precisely within the range, uh, along with five attachments, one of which is thumb-shaped. So if you want to feel like somebody's really digging into your shoulder you can you can do that with the uh, the thumb attachment and then there's the 599 dollar pro that's really meant for professional massage therapists it has a rotating arm swappable batteries a super soft attachment for sensitive areas and up to 60 pounds of force uh bluetooth connected ma massage thingies that that help relieve your sore muscles roger uh i whole product category that a lot of people may not have exi thought it, realized existed unless they had instagram so my, my question with this was you need someone to do it for you, especially if it's on your back, unless you have, you're have you incredibly dexterous and you can reach around. <laughs> uh, 
to your backs uh, to back. But um, I've always thought like stuff like this paired with with like an ergonomic chair that's just mounted and you could lean back into it would be great. Because well, one yeah, of the and- things. I think that's the idea with the Theragun Mini is that you'd be able to do that one on your own because it's one handed. Uh, so, yeah, maybe you could hook that up or or just like bolt it to a chair because, you know, those old chair style massages with the little uh, massagers for your lower back one of yeah. those uh-huh. devices. It sounds it sounds like a perfect way to, to update it. This is the thing. A lot of what people do today in the office requires a body uh, positioning that's actually highly stressful. You, your head's tilted down. You add a lot of weight. And I only know this from my chiropractor because I have, I, when I was going to him, he's saying, like, yeah, a lot of these desk jobs, when you're looking at a screen, you're putting a lot of pressure points on your body that isn't natural. And I think, you know, having a, 60 pounds of something ramming into my shoulder blades would be awesome. <laughs> so you're saying uh, Theragun is great for people who work out, but they should also be targeting their products at people yes. who don't work out and just exactly. sit in a chair all day. Yes, I, it might not seem like it, but you know, there's a lot of people need some uh, some good masseusing. Yeah, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. All right, let's talk Donkey Kong and libel law. In April 2018, Twin Galaxies announced that Billy Mitchell did not achieve his Donkey Kong high score on unmodified arcade hardware, uh, and therefore stripped him of all accumulated records. Uh, if you're like, wait a minute, what does that mean? The, the true Donkey Kong record is supposed to be set on a, on a Donkey Kong cabinet that would be pretty much the same as if you played it in an arcade when Donkey Kong was new. What you could do, I'm not saying this is what Billy Mitchell did. In fact, I don't even think Twin Galaxies is saying this is what he did. But one could take an emulator, put it inside a cabinet, and pretend like you're playing Donkey Kong, but not actually play it on the original. The reason you don't want to count that as the record is at that point, it's a slippery slope to putting in cheats or things that might help you win, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Twin Galaxies never said that Billy Mitchell somehow modified the software to his advantage. They said that they found evidence that this was not an unmodified cabinet and that their rules required them to only recognize a record that was done on a unmodified uh, cabinet. Well, Billy Mitchell's suing over that. Ars Technica uncovered that Mitchell filed a defamation lawsuit in LA County Court in April 2019 and is building a case that will finally come to a hearing on July 6th. But that hearing isn't over the libel accusations. That is an anti-slap motion. Uh, SLAP stands for Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation. Anti-SLAP laws let a defendant, in this case Twin Galaxies, strike down a lawsuit that can be shown to censor, intimidate, or silence a critic by burdening them with the cost of a legal defense. So if you can show the court, hey, the only reason they're taking me into court is they're trying to shut me up. Uh, They don't really have much of a case, but they just want to draw this out. You can get it dismissed faster than you would otherwise. Mitchell says that Twin Galaxies' decision to strip him of his record is libelous on its face. He prima facie, because it implies that Mitchell did not achieve his record score legitimately. He's like, the fact that they rescinded my record means they're accusing me of cheating. He argues that a reasonable reader would believe Twin Galaxy was calling Mitchell a cheater. However, Twin Galaxies has never used the word cheat or cheater. Mitchell isn't saying he did. They're saying he's just saying what they've done is tantamount to calling me a cheater. So they might as well. Twin Galaxies said the decision was based on a specific board transition image that would be impossible on an original unmodified Donkey Kong machine and agrees this is its opinion and harbors no animosity or ill will against Mitchell. That last is very important, because in libel law in the United States, you have to prove something called actual malice. It's not enough to say something about someone that's not true. Mitchell can't just prove that Twin Galaxies is saying he used uh, modified hardware when he didn't, Uh, Even if he's able to prove in court that he used unmodified hardware, that wouldn't win the libel case. He has to also prove that Twin Galaxies was conducting this 
change of uh, uh, or this this uh, uh, behavior because they actually had malice against him. And a 1964 Supreme Court ruling of New York Times Company versus Sullivan, Times versus Sullivan, it's very famous in in communication law, defines actual malice as knowledge that something was false or with reckless disregard of whether it was false or not. So you not only have to know it was false, you have to not care. Uh, and Twin Galaxies is saying, hey, man, we, we don't have any malice against Mitchell. Uh, we think we're right. Uh, it's an opinion. I guess I, they're not saying this, but the attitude is, I guess we could be wrong, but we don't think we are. And that really is tailored out of this actual malice. Uh, it's an opportunity to talk a little bit about communications law, I guess. But it's also interesting because it's Donkey Kong and Billy Mitchell. Right, Roger? It is. Uh, it, this is, to be honest... I, I never thought the King of Kong would have this much of a, a legacy behind it. The the documentary that featured uh, Billy Mitchell, um, and uh, you know what's really interesting is that the this this is something that uh, is taken in high regard because score counting is such a big deal, especially because um, I mean I'm not sure if Twin Galaxy still is, but at the time it was it was vetted by by Guinness Book of World Records. So any record that you did and it was uh, uh, a verified by Twin Galaxies could conceivably make it into the Guinness Book of World Records, making it like a very big deal. Um, and so, having having your score removed because of uh, allegations as well as s suspicion uh, that you know the rules weren't followed and and the game wasn't played the right way, I think is is a big deal. I you know a lot of this is I think uh, a, a, an attempt at least on Billy Mitchell's part to kind of reclaim some of the uh, pressed limelight like I, I just need to be in it just for a little mm -hmm. while just a little while but longer. I mean it's it's hard to say Billy Mitchell I, I don't know and I'm not going to try to ascribe yeah. motives to but I can imagine is someone who really thinks he deserves this record um, no matter what actually happened. He, he is saying publicly like, no, I used an unmodified cabinet. And, and I guess if you're Mitchell, the scenario is they're sh using a video to show a transition that is just an artifact of the video. Uh, and I had witnesses there watching me play this game on an unmodified cabinet. And he's going to pull all of that witness testimony yeah. and everything into court and expert testimony saying he's a good guy. But none of that matters because what he's suing on is libel law. And I don't think what Twin Galaxies did here constitutes libel. I mean, uh, in it, fact, they've covered their tracks pretty well to defend themselves against it being libel. It's not libelous to say, I don't think a person deserves a record. I mean, there's, I mean, uh, uh, just on the, on the look of it, I mean, like, you know, it, he really doesn't have too much of a case because because there there's nothing that has been recorded from Twin Galaxies that would indicate anything that would be considered libelous. Now, his what's implied, I mean, that that I mean, that's up to uh, how people perceive uh, what was stated. But nothing directly stated by them said that he cheated. Rather, that the that the 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 video that he gave to record is to to say this is my score from playing this game uh, uh, doesn't pass muster, and that you know that particular yeah. piece uh, isn't good enough. Well, folks, uh, if you've got uh, an opinion about this Donkey Kong decision or, or any other opinion, uh, it, as long as you have no actual malice in your heart, go and express it in our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, let's check out the mailbag. First of all, uh, George C. is a property manager and DJ. And both jobs are on hold right now. So in our continuing effort to, to spread the love around uh, and, and have those of you who have the ability to spend a little money, spend it on people who need it, uh, check out George C.'s DJ channel. He took his DJ gear and his DJ talents to Twitch at twitch.tv slash DJ George with an three instead of an E. So DJ George, but three at the end instead of an E. Uh, and he does uh, nightly sets. Go check it out, twitch.tv slash DJ George 3. Also, uh, Jay Namadon gave us his first impressions of the Apple Magic Keyboard for iPad in the DTNS Discord channel, saying, just got the Magic Keyboard. It's heavy, as expected, but my mind is adapting to using the trackpad very quickly. Nice not having to touch the screen for scrolling. The thing about the Magic Keyboard is, you know when you're using it wrong, as fingerprints really stand out now. Ah. 
<laughs> Shout outs to patrons at our master and grand master levels. These are the people who support us the most. Uh, thank you today to those among them, including Andrew Bradley, Scott Hepburn, and Dan Kolbeck. Uh, and thanks to the GDI folding team. Uh, Amos, you've been leading that team, man. Uh, thank you for, for doing this. The Good Day Internet folding team is now 119 members strong, having completed more than 7,500 simulations and is now sitting just outside the top 1,000 teams worldwide. Uh, if you would like to contribute a few of your spare cycles to the Folding at Home project, looking for proteins in general, but particularly proteins that can help uh, combat COVID-19, uh, join our team or join any team. But you can join our team by going to dailytechnewsshow.com slash folding. Thanks again, Amos, for doing that. You can always support our show at any level, dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon, and peruse our fine selection of DTNS stuff at dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Patrick Beja. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>